Good evening. I am Karen Taylor, Program Director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, and a very warm welcome on another wet evening. So thank you for um, dealing with the other weather and coming this evening. Uh, tonight's lecture is part of our Labour, Literature and Landmark Lecture Series. The Labour, Literature and Landmark Lectures are supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. For those of you who may be less familiar with the General Society, a brief introduction. The General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, a nonprofit organization, was founded in 1785 by 22 skilled craftsmen of the city. Today, our 233-year-old organization continues to serve and improve the quality of life of the people of the City of New York through our educational and cultural programs. These include our Tuition-Free Mechanics Institute, the General Society Library, of, of course, of which you're in this evening, uh, our Upstairs Lot Museum, which you're welcome to visit uh, after tonight's program, and our nearly 200 euro lecture series of which of course tonight's lecture is part of. Um, you will find uh, an informational postcard on the society and library membership on the registration table at the front of the room. In 1966, Rosemary Novella, Nov Novellino joined the Radio City Music Hall Ballet Company, the classical dance counterpart to the world famous Rockettes, eventually becoming its dance captain and assistant to the legendary choreographer Peter Gennaro. In the mid 1970s, behind the scene changes in the music hall management alarmed hundreds of employees, but no one was prepared for the official announcement in early 1978 that the Radio City Music Hall was slated to close. To close that April and be demolished. Absolutely shocking. Now, we are now going to hear the story of what happened. And the story of Rosemary Novellino Mearn's role in helping to prevent the destruction of Radio City Music Hall. The story is encapsulated in Saving Radio City Music Hall, which is Rosemary's first book and which is available for purchase this evening. It is now my great pleasure to introduce to you Rosemary Novellino Mearns and assisted, ably assisted by her husband, Bill. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here on this nasty day. Another one. Um, I really appreciate that you're here and it's such a privilege to have been invited to do this here today. And thank you, Karen. She is the first person who called me and we talked and we got along and she wanted me to do this and I was thrilled to get the invitation. Uh, before I start, Karen kind of gave it away a little bit. I want to introduce you to someone very important in my life, my darling husband, Bill. He deserves that. He deserves that. Um, when you hear this story, you will see that Bill and I went through all of this together, side by side. And he's also responsible for putting together the visual part of this presentation. I think he did a fabulous job. And tonight, he is my technical advisor. Now back in 1978, I led the fight to save Radio City Music Hall from possible demolition. This presentation is based on my book, Saving Radio City Music Hall, A Dancer's True Story, published by Turning Point Press. I grew up in a very pretty little town in New Jersey called Glen Rock. And we have a great big stupid rock in the middle of the town. <laughs> Nobody in New York believes me that this rock exists. There it is. And my ballet training was the next town over of Ridgewood. And my teacher and mentor was Irene Vokeen. 
And she was part of the very famous Russian Vokin ballet family. Her uncle was the renowned choreographer Mikhail Vokin. So she had very deep ballet roots. And all I wanted to do when I was a kid was be a ballet dancer. It was the most important thing in the world to me. And I was determined to make that dream come true. Now, Irene Vokin was a brutally strict teacher, but a wonderful teacher. I loved her very much. And when I left her studio, I was pretty much ready for the professional world because thanks to her, I had grown a very thick skin and I got into the ballet company at the music hall when I was just 18. Now, I was let go twice. You have to read the book to find out about that. But when I came back the third time, they say three's the charm, I ended up becoming, as Karen just said, the dance captain of the company and the president of the show people's committee to save the music hall. I'm gonna ask you a question and I'm pretty sure I know the answer. How many people here remember that the music hall used to show first run films? Yes, yes. <laughs> And it was a great place to see a movie. Oh my God, that huge screen. And before I tell you about this fabulous theater, and you're gonna hear a lot about it, I wanna make something perfectly clear. Now Karen tried to do this. I was in the ballet company. I was not a rocket. I hope you're not disappointed. I can kick just as high as a rocket, but I wasn't a rocket. We were two separate groups of dancers. The rockets were, and still are, the stars of the music hall, and the ballet company, we kind of felt like stepchildren because nobody even knew we existed. But a really important piece of history, the Radio City Music Hall Ballet Company was the first permanent ballet company in this country. Yeah, and I'm very proud to be part of that history. Now, the Music Hall officially opened its doors for the very first time on December 27, 1932. It was two days after Christmas, and it was a cold, wet, miserable night, a little worse than tonight. But it was a big, splashy, formal affair, and everyone who was anyone was invited, including... Amelia Earhart. The enormous theater was designed by Edward Doral Stone, and the Art Deco interior was done by Donald Desky. Donald Desky also did most of the furnishings throughout the theater, and I'm very happy to tell you that most of them are still there. As a matter of fact, Donald Desky became so famous after the music hall opened that he was asked to endorse products uh, in the popular magazines of the time. He also designed all the fixtures throughout the theater. Now, all of this awed the first-nighters and all audiences since. The music hall was, and I'm thrilled to say still is, an art deco palace. So let's go inside, because I want to show her off. This is the lobby, otherwise known as the grand foyer. It's the first room you enter when you go to the music hall. And you've all been in there. It's magnificent. And I'm going to tell you a secret about this room. Those great big tall mirrors that go up three stories are actually backed with gold leaf, not silver, like most mirrors. And that was done to ensure that a soft, warm glow fell over the guests, and it does. The lighting in that room is very unique. And now the next time you go in there, you'll know why. Let's head down to the Grand Lounge. This is another one of Donald Desky's designs, and it beckons you down that great big curved staircase to the Grand Lounge. And indeed, it is grand in its art deco artwork. Now, the ladies' room down on that level looks like something out of a Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers movie. And the men's room is sublime in its pure art deco artwork. This 
mural that hangs in the men's lounge is titled, Men Without Women. <laughs> and as you can see, there's a pipe and a barber pole and a razor, all that stuff that you guys do without us. Now, exhibited throughout the theater are several sculptures that were commissioned specifically for the musical. This is a very famous statue. It's called The Dancing Girl, and it was done by the artist Robert Laurent. And a really famous one. It's usually in the lower lounge. This is titled The Spirit of Dance, and it was done by the very well-known sculptor William Zorick. Both of these statues are cast in aluminum. Now, the only woman to contribute any design to the theater was Hildreth Meir. Isn't that a great picture? She means business, doesn't she? She designed three rondels representing dance, drama, and song. These are spectacular. They're 18 feet in diameter, and they can be seen on the outside wall on the 50th Street side of the building. So the next time you're standing there waiting for the 50th Street bus, look up, because these are beautiful. They were designed by Hildreth Meyer, but they were executed by the artist Oscar Bach. Now, the concept of the theater was from S.L. Rothfeld, otherwise known as Roxy. And he had another great big gorgeous theater one block away on the corner of 50th Street and 7th Avenue called the Roxy. But the Roxy showed movies and stage shows. And he wanted Radio City Music Hall to be the showplace of the nation and to do only stage presentations. Now, the interior of this theater held 6,200 seats without one obstructed view. And the reason there's no obstructed view is because that gorgeous sunburst ceiling is completely suspended from above. The stage is called the Great Stage because Roxy envisioned not only a huge space, but big, spectacular productions. So now we're going to go back to that grand opening in 1932. This is the actual program from that night, the original program from that opening night. And they had some very well-known performers in that show. And included in that were some of the vaudeville stars of the time. And among them were Ray Bolger, the Flying Walindas. For culture, they had the Martha Graham Dance Company featuring Martha Graham herself. They were opera stars from all over the world. The music hall ballet performed with the famous ballerina of the time, Patricia Bowman. And that world-renowned dancing troupe, the Roxyettes. They were not known as the Rockettes for another year. Now, this elaborate opening, unfortunately, was a complete bust. It started a half hour late. It ran over four and a half hours. People were leaving, they're going, enough, I can't take it anymore. And when Bill and I were doing the research, we found a review in the New York Times and one of the lines was, the show does not provoke much enthusiasm, but the theater, ladies and gentlemen, the theater got rave reviews. Everybody loved it, and they had never seen anything like it. So, after the opening, the board of directors, against Roxy's wishes, this is all in the book, decided the only way for this newfangled musical to survive would be to show movies along with the stage shows. So two weeks later, on January 11th, 1933, the first film, The Bitter Tea of General Yen, starring Barbara Stanwyck, opened, and the music hall became the most famous movie palace in the world. 
They would show movies and stage shows all day long. The movies ran five times a day. The stage shows ran four. And in its heyday, if a movie played the musical, it was considered a surefire hit. That's the kind of reputation it had. And when you look at the list of classic films that open at the musical, it is mind-blowing. And every single film is listed in the back of my book with the dates. Just look at these movies. Every one of them is a hit. There were over a hundred world premieres at the theater. And now they're all our classics. Whenever a film changed, the show changed. And in the beginning of its life, these movies only lasted one to two weeks. I don't know how they did that because in all the years I worked there, we did one two-weeker. It was brutal. And they did that for two years. And believe it or not, the first film to break all records and run five long weeks was none other than Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And that opened in 1938. Hard to believe, isn't it? By the 1940s, the average run of a film was between three to six weeks, depending on the success of the movie, of course, and the reviews. Rehearsals would start two weeks before the movie changed. And we would rehearse between, while well, the movie was playing between the shows up in the large rehearsal hall upstairs. And whenever we had to do stage rehearsals, they were brutally early. Um, the theater would always open with a movie. And it would, the doors would open between 9 and 9.30, depending on the length of the movie, so we had to be off that stage by 9 o'clock. This is a dress rehearsal shot. This was taken at 6.30 in the morning. And that's Peter Gennaro standing next to me right there for any of you that knew that man. He was a wonderful human being. Now, the longest a film ran when I worked there was Airport in 1970. It was a mega hit. It was an Easter show and it ran 12 long weeks. We thought we were on a holiday because we didn't have rehearsals for two months. It was fabulous. <clears throat> now, as I said earlier, I was in the ballet company, and I worked there for 12 years. These are some rehearsal shots that were taken in the large rehearsal hall of me. There were two rehearsal halls. There was a big one and then a smaller one. They're both up on the eighth floor, and that's where everything was created. And then you would bring it down onto the stage. Now, the ballet company, they were very versatile. We did everything from classical ballet on point to jazz and character numbers. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> and then when Peter Gennaro came in, we did a lot of musical theater numbers. And after I was there about five years, I was asked to become dance captain. And this is a shot of me in the ballet office. It was one flight above the dressing room, so you could just throw on a robe and run upstairs and work on payroll or whatever you had to do. But sadly, in 1974, the musical decided to cut costs, and they eliminated the ballet as a permanent group, and we were all let go. And I felt like my world had ended. I loved working there. But about six, we all scattered. We all did shows all over the place. And about six months later, Peter Gennaro, I'm talking a lot about Peter, aren't I? decided for his upcoming Easter show that he wanted another group of dancers besides just the Rockettes. So the musical threw an audition. Every dancer in New York showed up, including all of us. And what they ended up doing, they hired about half of us back and then they hired some new people. And we weren't permanent anymore. We were hired like the singers per show, but we worked most of the year. The only ones that had the permanent status were the Rockettes. And, but we worked all year long anyway. And when I came back this time was when I met my future husband, Bill. This is true. When the ballet was fired, Peter, Gennaro hired Bill to be a soloist singer at the musical, and then I came back, and we met. The irony, I 
thought my world had ended, and what happened was the best thing in my world happened. And I mean that. Thank you. Okay, enough romance. Here's a fact. With the exception of the Christmas show and the Easter show, which always had a built-in audience, at Christmas time, everybody wants to come and see the nativity with the live animals, with the donkeys and the sheep and those nasty camels. Oh, they're horrible. They spit and kick and do all this stuff backstage. It's horrible. At Easter time, everybody wanted to come and see the Easter pageant when we made the cross with the lilies. Don't know if you know this, but that set was designed by Vincent Minnelli. He started his career at the music hall. And they used that until we left. Wish they'd bring that back. Anyway, but the rest of the year, it was the movie that got the people into those seats. And as you just saw, the movies used to be top of the line. But somewhere in the mid-70s, things started to change. The movies got a little strange. And then they got downright bad. Have any of you ever heard of the film Hennessy? Big crowd, Bill. No one ever heard of it. It, no. Get out of here. You heard of it. Yeah. Yeah, horrible, horrible movie. And then there was The Black Windmill. Doesn't that sound uplifting? Two people heard of that thing, wow. Uh, and then there was The Bluebird. Not the cute one with, with the Shirley Temple, no, no, no. The really bad one that Elizabeth Taylor got roped into starring in. These movies were really bad. And in the book, my publisher made me do this. I see you've made it. My darling publisher, Andy Wenting, is here. Um, He said, you got to put some reviews in there so that the people don't think this is your opinion. But he was absolutely right. And so we have a couple of quotes from the reviews of that period. And it was not a pretty picture. And the musical started to lose money. And I will tell you, honestly, there were times when that great big beautiful gold curtain would go up And there were more of us on stage than in that audience. Look at the size of that audience. Talk about depressing. And we were all backstage in our dressing rooms, whatever, going, what is going on? We knew that there were other movies out and blockbusters, but they weren't getting booked at the music hall. And then during the Christmas show of 1977-78, this happened. At a better time, it brought so much glitter and entertainment into the lives of millions of New Yorkers in the depths of the Great Depression. And after all these years, there was a sad announcement about that music hall today. I'm announcing the closing of Radio City Music Hall at the end of the 1978 Easter show on April 12th. There was no last-minute reprieve this time. Last year, employees took a pay cut to keep Radio City open, but nothing could save it this time. I worked my ass off for five years to keep this uh, this theater open, and I have we have a number of corporations for which I'm responsible, and I put more time on this corporation than I have all of the others put together, and it's uh, no one wants to shoot Santa Claus. One final question: Is there any chance the music hall will stay open? No. Indeed. Well, Bill and I were at that news conference that horrible morning because the night before, um, they had requested that all the captains of their departments, by this time Bill had been made captain of the singers, captains of the departments and heads of departments should show up at this mysterious news conference the next morning. But they did not tell us what it was about. So there we stood in the state of shock. Didn't know what to do. We're in the bit large rehearsal hall and all these cameras and flash bulbs are going off and I'm thinking, what did he say? And we went down to my ballet office because we were at the theater way too early to start putting makeup on and everything. And we didn't know what to do. 
uh, we just kept saying, how did this happen? How did they let this happen? The newspapers that morning said that they were either going to tear it down or make it into, are you ready? Make it into an amusement park. That's just what we need in the middle of Manhattan is an amusement park with the whole city's an amusement park. <laughs> or they were going to make it into a shopping mall. Oh, gosh, we don't have any stores in New York. We need a shopping mall. And then the best was, many of you will remember this name, Andrew Stein. He was the Manhattan Borough President. It was a headline. I still have it. Andrew Stein wants to turn Radio City Music Hall into the American Stock Exchange. Really? We didn't know what to do. We didn't know who to believe. But we were encouraged when we heard Mayor Koch say this. The theater in New York City would be the poorer for the loss of uh, the music hall. It is a question of a tourist attraction. Uh, it is one of our major tourist attractions. And so obviously, if I'm interested in keeping uh, business here and enhancing it, uh, I want to uh, keep as many of those tourist attractions open. If they tore down that fantastic place, they would never build another theater with that Art Deco design. Wrong period, not going to happen. Or with the theatrical capabilities built into that stage. I'm going to show you some examples of what that stage can do. And please remember, this was built in 1932. The stage, which is desi was designed by Peter Clark, and I want you to know that his great-grandnephew, Kevin Clark, is in the audience today. He, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Peter Clark designed this stage. The stage is divided into three elevators. Each elevator can go up by itself, one at a time, two at a time, or all three. It's all done with hydraulic lifts, just like an aircraft carrier. And the orchestra pit does the same thing. There's a turntable, the complete width of the stage. You can see the outline of it in this photograph. Now, the turntable can go around, and all three elevators can go up while it's spinning. Turntable can go around, and all three elevators can descend. Thank you, Peter Clark. I'm going to show you a very short clip of the turntable in use. This was the opening of one of the ballets that I did there. Of course, the mighty Wurlitzer, which happens to be the world's largest theater organ. And of course, it was designed specifically for the music hall. I always call this picture the organ in its cubby hole. Um, oh, you've all seen this. When the organist comes in and sits down, they press a button on the left-hand side, and that whole console comes out. It's on track, so you can see the organ and see the organist. And when they're done, they press that button. It goes back in, and little gold curtains close. Um, I have some information about the organ in the book, the pipes and how it's maintained and the size of the pipes. And I will tell you, especially when you're in the dressing rooms, when they play this magnificent instrument, it shakes the rafters. Um, it's very powerful. And there were actually two consoles, one on either side of the stage, as you can see in this picture. Now, this is a shot of the orchestra. I'm going to step away from the camera from uh, camera from the microphone to show you something. I want you to look at this brown section. This section that the orchestra is sitting on is called the band car. And some of you are shaking your head and scratching your head, going, "What did she say?" I said the band car. Let me explain. 
When the orchestra comes up from the basement on this hydraulic lift, they have this capability, and you probably have seen them do this. They can raise the orchestra to the level of the stage, and then while the musicians are playing without missing a beat, and that pun was intended, it goes and it moves on to the stage. Band as in musical band, car as in vehicle. And in the book, I do give away the well-guarded, silly secret of how that band car moves. <laughs> there is a steam curtain. Unfortunately, we couldn't find a picture of it anywhere. It runs parallel to the footlights, and it shoots up a whole wall of steam, and it's so intense that they can project film on it. This steam curtain connected to New York City sewer steam system. They thought to put that in in 1932. Above the steam curtain is a rain curtain. And when it rains on that stage, it rains hard. I've been under it, you get wet. The rain curtain is connected to New York City waterworks. How forthinking were these men to put all these special effects into this theater in 1932? It had its own costume department up on the eighth floor. This was right down the hall from the rehearsal studio. So you would have a rehearsal, and then uh, at the end of the rehearsal, at you know, 12.38, you had a costume fitting. Around the corner from here, up a couple of steps, was a complete hat department, where they made the hats, the wigs, and the headpieces. And in the basement of the building was a full scenic studio. Everything was self-contained in this building. Now, besides the ballet that you've heard an awful lot about tonight, there were the world-famous Rockettes. What would the musical be without the Rockettes? The Rockettes made the musical famous, and the musical made the Rockettes famous. There was a chorus of singers. This is a shot of Bill. He used to have a mustache. I took that from the wings. This was our last Easter show together. It was a staff of 40 ushers, all in formal attire. And I'm going to stop here for one second to tell you that there's two of them here in this building. Frank Devlin, who was a very important part of our committee, <laughs> and this is really delightful. In the Early 50s, as a young man, Simon Salzman was an usher, and we just met two years ago. And Simon is sitting right there. God bless. Stand up, Simon. He has, he has great stories that he told me, a little before my time. And also, when Bill and I worked there, there was a 70-piece symphony orchestra my goodness, we kept saying, this is all worth fighting to save. And we're in that silly little ballet office, and I'm saying to Bill, we have to do something. What are we going to do? I don't know what to do. I'm a ballet dancer. And I was pacing back. It's a really small office. And I was pacing back and forth like a lioness in a cage. I had never done anything like this in my life. And I picked up the phone. I was scared. I was angry. And I called NBC across the street. That phone call led to another phone call. And within an hour, I was booked to appear on a local TV show with a couple of the Rockettes, The Bill Boggs Show, next morning. We have Rosemary Novellino here. Yes. Rosemary, where are you? She is a dance captain for the ballet. A welcome, please, for Rosemary <laughs> Novellino. Hello. Where did you study, Rosemary? Uh, most of my studying was in New Jersey with Irene Vokin, and then I also studied in the city with several major schools. You've been dancing since you were how old? Three and a half years old. What would you like to see happen to Radio City Music Hall now? I would like to see Radio City remain as it is, if at all possible. I mean, it is known nationwide, it is known Also as world. a piece of art and architecture, as a, as a symbol of uh, architecture, the well, early 30s and art right. deco, there's almost nothing else like it. That's there is right. nothing else like it's it. One of the he was so annoying. All he wanted to do was flirt with those rockets behind me. And when he was interviewing them, I was standing off camera. 
and fumes are coming on my ears because I'm thinking, this is not why we're here, we're here to save the building, and I'm getting all serious. And then when I finally got on camera, I was like deadly serious. He wanted me off of there so <laughs> bad, I was not going to play with him. But it doesn't matter. When we got back to the theater was when I said to Bill, we have to do something right now. This is the day after the announcement. And I said, we just have to do something. And so we called a meeting of all the employees after the first show. We were still doing the Christmas show. Merry Christmas, everybody. So we did the first show. Bill and I got out of our costumes and ran upstairs to the large rehearsal hall, and we were the first ones up there. And we were reading an article in the New York Times about the situation, and the door opened. And the first two people to walk through that door, it wasn't a rockette or a ballet girl or a singer or an usher. It was a musician and a stagehand. And I turned to Bill and I went, this is serious. And within 15 minutes, there were 300 people staring at me. It was daunting. I don't remember my speech, but I do remember how I started. And I sit to looked at everybody and I said, we have nothing to lose. We are out of here on April 12th and this building is dust. And so it began. We quickly became organized and we formed a committee and we called ourselves the Show People's Committee to Save Radio City Musical and they elected me the president. And this was our poster. One of the musician's wives was an illustrator and she did this snappy poster for us. And we plastered New York City with it. And then when anybody went home to their hometown, we gave them a poster. Take a poster, take a poster. And soon this poster was across the country. We wrote letters to everyone. We wrote to movie stars and Broadway stars and politicians and community leaders. We wrote to newspapers and TV shows. Remember, this was way before Facebook or email was even a dream in anybody's head. The only social media we had needed a stamp. We created a petition and we would go out and ask the people on the line to sign the petition. The minute this was announced, the line was around the block again like the good old days. I took this picture hanging out the third floor ballet dressing room and we had a schedule, we had our clipboards and we would go out every day between every single show. And the women, anyway, we, we, didn't take, we went out with our full stage makeup and street clothes. We didn't take that makeup all four times a day. We would have no skin. It was rather intense. The eyelashes were out to here. And we had a schedule. Every day there were at least five or six of the employees on that line asking people to sign the petition. And I... They were very enthusiastic about signing it, and I know they got a kick. I'm not stupid, I know. Okay, you're waiting online to see a show, and now you're meeting somebody in the show, especially the Rockettes and the ballet girls had all this makeup on, and that was fun for them. I th would think it's fun, too, if I was online and I met somebody in the show. But those people had no idea what they were doing for our morale because the morale inside that building was horrible. We had a lot of help, a lot of help from a lot of people. Nobody, I'm gonna repeat this, nobody does this by themselves. The Hilton Hotel, down the street from the musical on 53rd and 6th, gave us a ground floor office for free for three months. They didn't want it to close either. This is a shot of Bill in that office when we got the prototype of our sign. This office also had something we don't think too much about anymore, something called long distance. I was calling everywhere. I was calling California and the Hilton did not charge us one single cent. I got a letter, we got a letter, the co committee got a letter from a gentleman by the name of Dr. Joseph Rosenberg. And when I opened the letter and read it, it stated that he had been involved in helping to save Grand Central. 
I thought, oh my gosh, we have to talk to this man. And the committee said, Rosie, yeah, you gotta call him. And I will confess to you, I was intimidated. I kept looking at his name, Dr. Joseph Rosenberg, oh my God. And I thought he was gonna be this highly intelligent, arrogant person, and here's this ballet dancer gonna call him. And, and I kept staring at the letter, but he put his phone number on the letter. So from somewhere, again, I got the courage and I dialed, this tells you how long ago it was. Um, he answered on the first ring. And he was one of the sweetest, nicest, kindest men besides my darling Bill. Uh, he, we talked for almost a half an hour. And he let me ask him all kinds of questions. And then finally I asked him a big one. I said, would you mind coming in and talking to the committee and guiding us down the right path for this landmarking? And you know what his answer was to a total stranger ballet dancer person? He said, tell me where and when and I'll be there. Two days later, he was standing in front of the committee. And if he hadn't come in, if Joe hadn't come in and tell, tell, tell us this important information, huh, I don't know if the building would still be there. And I do call him Joe because Joe and his wife Norma and Bill and I are still very dear friends and he did the foreword for my book. I love Joe Rosenberg. I did a, several other TV shows and radio shows around the city, local things. Do you guys remember the Joe Franklin show? <laughs> I did this with the uh, captain of the Rockettes, Joyce Dwyer. And Joyce and I had a very good time on Joe's show. He was absolutely charming. But he, he really wanted to help us. He was very enthusiastic about uh, helping us save the building. He loved the theater. And after I did this show, uh, a couple days later, I got a phone call at home. I, he called me at home, and he asked me if I would do his radio show the following Wednesday. No, Saturday. It was on a weekend. And, of course, I said yes. So Bill and I went over and did it. Now, the... The radio show was very, uh, it was much more serious than the TV show. The TV show was light and fluffy. We got our point across, but it was charming. This, he asked very pointed questions. It was a wonderful interview. We got a lot of information out, and I will always, always be grateful to Joe Franklin for his help. I was on the radio a lot. Do you remember Art Athens? He was on WCBS. I'm looking at Frank because we all became very close to Art. He, Art Athens and Joe Rosenberg were two angels that came and landed in front of us. And I don't know if what we did would have happened without them. Um, he was a big deal on WCBS radio. He became our coach, our friend. He was wonderful. He also made sure I was on his radio show three to four times a week. When Bill and I found out he passed away, we were heartbroken. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. And then I was invited to go out to California to do, do you remember Tom Snyder, Tomorrow Show? Well, we were very excited when we got this. And I was going to do it with Ron Hokuf, who was another very strong member of the committee and a singer with Bill. Uh, and then Ron and I went into complete state of panic. And we talked about this all the way out on the plane. Um, we felt like we had the responsibility of 400 employees on our shoulders, and this was our first national TV appearance. Two members of the Show People's Committee to Save Radio City Music Hall, and they will detail their efforts for us tonight on how they're going. You two are facing some very, very stiff competition. You have uh, the Rockefeller Center people who say that it's been losing money for a long, long time. You have the motion picture people who say they can't supply the kinds of product that is necessary to keep that place going with family trade. How do you buck that kind of competition against you? Well, I think if we, if we can make everybody realize how important the music hall is. It's an institution. It's the only one of its kind in this country. And the, I feel, and the committee feels, that the music hall is, as I said before, an institution. The Rockettes are an art form. It's an American art form. And we've been chopping away at so many things in this country, and especially in New York, which I love. But if we keep chopping, there's not going to be anything left. And, well, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I, I think it's a crime if they let the music hall close 
it is over. It is gone. They will not build another Radio City Music Hall. There will not be another line called the Rockettes. They own the name. And so many people have grown up going to music hall. I did. I, I went there as a child. My parents took me. That was the first time I saw live entertainment. Exactly. We have Rockettes and ballet girls down in blizzards with petitions. How many signatures do we have now? We have over 70,000 signatures on petitions. And that's petitions for what? To keep the music hall open. And who do they go to? We are bringing them to the landmark hearing. Mm -hmm. Well, the landmark hearing is coming up in March. March 14th. March 14th. We shall report back. I hope that this has helped get the word out. I hope and for so. all those people who do not live in New York, who have been to that city and have been to the music hall and know what it is, now you know what's going to happen if somebody doesn't do something. Thing. Thanks for making the trek out. I hope it turns out to have been well worth your while. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Rosemary. Thank you, Ron. Oh. Jeez. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, really. Th that's for him. He was absolutely fantastic. He calmed Ron and I down after the first commercial. <coughs> Excuse me. We did the whole show. This is just a clip. He was absolutely terrific and some some important things happen because of this appearance uh, and when we got back it became very clear to all of us that Rockefeller Center was vehemently against saving the music hall we caused publicity stunts whenever we could to keep the fight on the news and in the minds of the public, we quickly realized that if the public kept seeing us, then our issue would not go away. I really did not want to become yesterday's news. And this was one of our better efforts at getting news media attention. Thanks for signing our petition. We're not giving up our fight. That's why we have suits of armor on. The Rockettes and other performers took to the sidewalk to collect signatures from the weekend crowds awaiting to get in. They did this between performances, and they collected quite a few names. Today, the performers who work inside the music hall were outside, in costume, getting signatures on petitions. We're the show people's committee to save music hall, and we think it's a shame if they close this great place. It's an American institution. Why close it? We are not giving up the fight to save Radio City Music Hall, even though it is going to close on April 12th. We're still going to be in there fighting. We still want people to write and sign the petition, and let's keep this place open. Hoping that some 11th hour miracle will stop the closing, the workers had a lot of support from their public. Do you think that's important, ma'am? Well, I certainly do. I think it's a disgrace. This place is a landmark. I've been here since I was a little girl. I think it's terrible. The performers hope to pressure the state and federal government for additional support to keep the music hall operating. This stunt really made the music hall mad at us. Oh, my, 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 my. And when and if you do read the book, <laughs> I hope you do, you will find out why we were in armor, and I think you will be a little surprised. Now, some of the politicians were completely against what we were trying to do. I guess it all depended on which way the political wind was blowing. As a matter of fact, our dear sweet mayor, who we thought was in our corner, completely changed his tune. I am not in a position to compel a businessman to stay open and lose $3 million a year. I am not defending him by any means. I was not a fan. But we found out many years later that he was getting a lot of pressure from the Rockefellers to not save the music hall. This is exactly what we were up against. Every time we thought we had made a positive move forward, somebody of importance would come along and try to push us right back down where they thought we belonged, and I would have none of it. Marianne Krupsack, who was the lieutenant governor at the time under Governor Hugh Carey, his term was just about up. Well, she started to pay attention to us after we did a few of these TV shows. Because of all the publicity we were causing and the theatrical nature of our issue, the press gave us a lot of attention. We were on the news a lot. And Marianne Krupsack 
attached herself to our bandwagon. She contacted us, called us, and soon became our political champion in the fight to save the musical. Unfortunately, we needed a politician. We were fighting politicians. But she wanted the publicity we could get for her. Personally, I thought that she thought that getting involved in saving the musical was going to get her elected the next governor. Now, there were celebrities that helped us, and the very first one was Cheetah Rivera. Um, she came over and stood outside with Bill and all the other male singers and sang, You've Got to Have Heart from Damn Yankees. Bill changed the lyrics around, and there was Cheetah with all her guys under the marquee singing her heart out, and we will always be grateful to Cheetah for that. Phyllis Diller wrote us a beautiful letter from California stating that she would lend her name to anything we needed it for to help to save the musical. Beautiful letter, beautiful woman. Uh, just so grateful for that, and we did use her name. The Oscar-winning actor, Cliff Robertson, oh, what a nice guy he was. He was so down to earth and so much fun. He was very enthusiastic about helping us. He would do anything we asked him to do. He was just terrific. Now, his wife, the actress Dina Merrill, she was not happy with his involvement with us at all. No, 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 no. But he didn't care. He just kept coming over and doing anything we asked, including trying to sing once. But the star that helped us the most was the beautiful movie star Arlene Dahl. Yeah, it is. She is a wow, isn't she? And I will tell you, for any of you who have never met her, she is as nice as she is a beautiful. And that's really nice. Uh, Bill and I were invited to her apartment to talk about what she could do for us. And I was trying to be very sophisticated, of course, and pulled together, and she opened the door, and I tried to stay calm, but internally, I was going, oh. She took my breath away. She looked just like that. Um, and she treated us like long lost friends. She was charming. And we, we talked for a long time. And she's also very smart. And because of her efforts, her connections, and her smart, smart brain, she got me booked on Good Morning America for the very morning of the landmark hearing. That was her idea, not mine. Uh, she's still with us. She's 91. Um, and I will always, always be grateful to her for her help. It was a huge, huge help, what she did for us. Now, as soon as I was booked on ABC for that show, um, a day, the next day, I think, I got a phone call from them at home. and They said, do you think you can get Marianne Krupsack to be on the show with you? I didn't say this, but I thought, she's a politician. Why wouldn't she want to be on television? So... On March 14th, at 8 o'clock in the morning, Marianne Krupsack and your friend Rosie here appeared on Good Morning America outside under the marquee. The minute this was over, we went across the street down into the subway hall because we had to go to City Hall. And much to my embarrassment at that period of my life, none of us knew where City Hall was. <laughs> I didn't know. Now I know it quite well. But Joe Rosenberg went, follow me, and down into the subway. We all went and did that. Now, this was another good publicity stunt we did. About a week or so before the landmark hearing, we were brainstorming. How are we going to get publicity for us at this landmark hearing? And it was like my head exploded. It was like, Phew. We'll get the Rockettes to do an impromptu kick line on the steps of City Hall. The press will come running over. So I went over to talk to the Rockettes. The ballet dressing room was on the 50th Street side. The Rockettes dressing room was on 51st Street. So I ran across the stage up to the Rockette dressing room, and I said, hey, guys, can you bib it? And of course they said yes. And then Bill and I went up to the costume department, and we asked Penny and Leanne, the two women that ran the shop, can you make sashes, a la Miss America, and put Rockette on it? Well, they went that way, really. Uh, so the girls can wear this over their street clothes. And of course they said yes. Everybody was on the same page. And then I threw on my Easter pageant costume. We were doing Easter show now. 
and went down to the basement to the musicians and said, please, can you please, can some of you please come and play so the rock has to have something to dance to. And so this was our impromptu kick line on the steps of City Hall. This could be one of the Rockettes' last performances. It was choreographed to precision. On this bleak March morning on the steps of City Hall, they helped launch one of the most intensive lobbying efforts the City Landmarks Commission has ever seen, the fight to save Radio City Music Hall. When we got inside, Alton Marshall was one of the first to speak. Hundreds of people want to save Radio City. Before the Landmarks Commission, they were arguing that the music hall be made a landmark. That would put legal hurdles in the way of any sale or change. Legal hurdles that Rockefeller Center's president says is just what the music hall doesn't need. Landmark designation will bring about another negative accomplishment. It will leave me no choice but to apply for a permit to demolish the structure the day after such designation goes into effect so that at the end of 305 days I will be free to act. I was one of those people booing. I spoke about an hour after him that still makes me so mad. I just, my hand goes into a fist every time I hear that, and I hear it a lot now. Uh, I spoke at about an hour after him, and that's after my speech is when we presented the petitions. Bill and one of the male dancers, Tommy Healy, presented them very dramatically. And <clears throat> at this point, without any exaggeration, we had over 150,000 signatures from all over the world and these signatures had a major effect on the landmarking. Keep that in mind the next time you want to landmark something. That was March 14th. Two weeks later, on March 28th, I got a phone call in the ballet dressing room. There were the ballet and the rockets. We had two rooms and a hallway with two pay phones in the middle, and you would get phone calls all day, and so, Rosie, telephone, and I went out, and it was Joe Rosenberg and Art Athens yelling into the same receiver because they wanted me to know, to be the first to know, that the Landmark Commission had designated the interior of the musical a city landmark. Now, I don't think you can see that, so Bill's going to blow that up for you. <laughs> really? Honestly. Now, the city landmark would give the theater a 361-day reprieve. Couldn't touch it for almost a year, and they would have a year to figure out how to make it viable again. And our next step was to have it made a national historic landmark, and then it would be saved forever. But the doors were still going to close on April 12th. So we continued to pull publicity stunts whenever we could to keep it on the minds of the public. The landmarking alone was not going to keep the doors open, and we desperately wanted to make sure the doors didn't close and it remained an active landmark theater. And now the closing date was upon us, April 12th, 1978. And it's a day that Bill and I will never, ever, ever forget as long as we live. It was also one of the hardest days in my life to get through. The morning started with all of us in our apartments watching the Today Show. They did the second hour, eight to nine, on the stage of the musical. And that is the great gold curtain at the Radio City Music Hall, one of the most famous places of entertainment anywhere in the world. Now, this show ended up being a complete fiasco. It started off sweet and charming with two Rockettes on the stage with Gene Chalet. Remember Gene Chalet? That's Joyce Dwyer that I did the Joe Franklin and that's the blonde is Carol Harbick. Charming, little history about the Rockettes, musical. And it turned into a political war live on television. We couldn't believe what we were hearing. Bill and I were in our own apartments, but we were watching it together over the phone. And all we could say to each other was, we're doomed. 
who are absolutely doomed. And we all went to work, and everybody's head was hanging down even lower after this mess, and tried to get through the day. Um, it was on television all day long. That's how big a deal it was. And uh, then it was finally time for that last show. And the music hall had decided to make that show a, uh, a charity benefit for the Variety Club Foundation of New York. It was a charity for children. That's very nice. Kudos to them. And the audience was all invited. But they hired Stanley Siegel to MC the beginning of the show. And Stanley Siegel was a TV personality, for lack of a better term. And Stanley Siegel did not do his homework. And we're all in the wings watching this, and they had this wonderful newsreel that none of us had ever seen of the opening of the musical and the beginning of the Rockettes. It was black and white, of course, and he didn't know what he was talking about. And here we are in this building we've been trying to save, and he's almost making a mockery of it. We wanted to kill him. And then finally the show started. Now, it was an Easter show, so it started with the Easter pageant. I don't know how many of you have ever seen the Easter pageant. It's very solemn. It's religious. And the minute the curtain went up, all we heard was, don't go, don't close. Ugh. It was so hard to stay in whatever character you were in. None of us made eye contact on stage because we would burst into tears. And to say that it was a little tense backstage, uh, the tension wasn't pouncing off the walls. It was crashing against the walls. People were bickering and crying and arguments were going. It was horrible. It was horrible back there. And the poor Rockettes, the number they did for that Easter show ended on the passerelle. For any of you who don't know what a passerelle is, it's the extension of the stage that comes out around the outside of the orchestra pit. And when you're on the passerelle, I was on it a lot, you are really close to the audience. You are touching close, closer than I am to Karen here. You can touch the audience and they can touch you. Um, <laughs> that's where the Rockettes finished their number. And when they finished, 6,000 people jumped to their feet, screaming bravo, throwing flowers at the women. And as the flowers were flying over their heads, the tears were streaming down their faces. You might be the last people to see this show the way it is. The capacity crowd of 6,000 seemed unwilling to accept that this show could be the last for the music hall and for the Rockettes and the singers and stagehands and costumers. The crowd cheered and applauded throughout the performance, and even as spectators stood for a final ovation, late negotiations continued between the state and city, and Rockefeller Center, the owner of the music hall, whose managers insisted the landmark had to be closed because of multi-million dollar losses. was the actual finale of the show and the theater was 46 years old at this point and there never have been any any uh, curtain calls but God bless the two stage managers that night for us they kept this going for a full 10 minutes curtain came down, it's still hard to watch, when the curtain came down, we still did not know the outcome. Um, but we had decided to go out in style. 
We were going to have a party, and we decided to have it at the Rainbow Room. We couldn't afford the big fancy one upstairs, but we could afford the grill, which was the one underneath. We collected the money, and they gave us a little break. And we were going to get all dressed up and go to the Rainbow Grill. And it was either going to be a celebration or a wake, and we didn't know. But when I was backstage during that show, the head stage manager, Frank Hawkins, came up to me and handed me a piece of paper, and he said, Rosie, take this. You may need this tonight. And I said, what is it? And he said, it's John Jackson's phone number. John Jackson was the senior vice president at the time. I didn't know why he was doing this. I said, okay, and I stuck it in my costume. And then when I got all glammed up to go to the party, I, something told me, I stuck it in the bosom of my gown. I didn't put it in my bag. I don't know why I did that, but I did that. And Bill and I went to the party. And at exactly 11 50, 10 minutes to midnight, the assistant stage manager, Steve Kelleher, came running up to me like an insane person, and he went, Rosie, you have to call John Jackson right now. You have to call John Jackson right now. And so, of course, I picked up on the same thing. I went, oh, okay, okay. I, and I didn't know where the phone was. We didn't have cell phones in 1978. So I went to a gentleman from the Rainbow Room, and I said, do you have a phone I could use? And he escorted me into the hall to a wooden phone booth, and I ran out of there so fast, I didn't bring my evening bag, and I sat down, and I went, I turned to him, and I went, I don't have any money. And he handed me a dime. I will never forget this man in a tuxedo handing me a dime. I made the call, ran back into the party to make this announcement. My name is Rosemary Novellino. What did you find out? I called the Vice President's Office, John Jackson. I spoke to Music Hall's attorney, Alan Jaffe. He said, tell everyone we're in business to report to work tomorrow. Music Hall has been saved. Uh, we had heard rumors. I ran to the phone and called one of our vice presidents, John Jackson. He spoke to me briefly for a second and put me on the phone with Music Hall's attorney, Alan Jaffe. And Alan Jaffe said, tell everyone the musical has been saved and to report to work tomorrow. And I said, thank you. <laughs> and I got off the phone and ran back in here. It's just, I can't believe it. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this major David and Goliath accomplishment was done in three months. But that's not the end of the story. For that, you got to read this book. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you, thank you, that's so generous. Thank you so much. I don't know how to cope with that. Uh, if you have any questions, yes, sir. Uh, before we start the Q&A, oh. I would like to remind people that this is being recorded, so please wait until the microphone gets to you before, we, uh, before asking the question. Huh? Sorry. Wait, um, I'm wait just for going the to say, just because um, we're just going to take a few questions, if you don't mind, sure. and then people can speak to you informally Absolutely. afterwards. Yes. Thank you. The book is on sale in the back. Yes. I'll be there in a little while. <laughs> well, a few hours ago, I just came from Pratt Institute's 12th annual commencement, and the place was packed. Uh, 655 students graduate. The, the very top fourth balcony only had a few people, but everything else was packed. And it was absolutely wonderful. And the organ played, and what can I say? Uh, did they do it at the music hall? This My brother graduated from Pratt year. Institute. It's our 12th year. Fabulous. He didn't graduate from inside the music hall. We went to Pratt. But thank you for saying that. That's wonderful. They played the organ. That's cool. Yes, ma'am. Hi there. I wanted to ask you, why do you think the Rockefellers <laughs> took such a negative stance? I mean, all right, it was losing money. But they had money, and they had power. And they were into Art Deco architecture. Like uh, the actual answer that? to that is in the book. But uh, <laughs> honestly, uh, <laughs> they just needed more money that week. Honest to God, it was just that. It was that. As the president of the Art Deco Society of New York, we want to thank you very much. For oh, my God, thank you. <laughs> wow. Now, thank Bravo. you. Oh, stop, 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 stop. Thank you. How nice. I would like to meet you in the back. Thank you for coming. I'm very touched that you said that because 
Art Deco is one of my favorites, and that is a true gem. Thank you for coming. One more question. One more question. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful presentation, first of all. You're welcome. Really Thank you for very, being here. <laughs> and from your own experience, yet, yeah, this is all the more meaningful. My question is, what is what was the most valuable landmarking status advice that uh, Mr. Rosenberg um, explained to you? Um, that's also, that that's also in the book, but I sort of gave some of it away in this. Um, I, we didn't know anything about landmarking. You go into this because of passion. We didn't, what do we know? We were singer, dancers, actor people, ushers. We, we were employees of the theater. And so you're going to landmark it. Let's landmark it. I thought you landmark a building, it's landmarked. When Joe, we had started it, just a regular landmarking. When Joe came in, he stood in around the 30 of us and he said, change it to the interior. If you do not, the shell will be here. They can make it into a tennis court. And we went, I didn't know. And I called Marianne Krupsack the next day and said, Cha change that. We have to change it to the interior. Because then it has to remain a theater. And because we did that, and it was landmarked, when they refurbished it, and this is the last thing I'll say, and then we'll go in the back. When they refurbished it 15 years ago, they had to get the same carpet, the same doorknobs, there's fabric against the back wall. The same thing had to be reprinted. They can't change it. Yes. Good question. Let's go do books. I'm sorry. Am I, am I messing up your... your... Right. Um, oh. Just before, we just, if you, we just ask you to uh, wait a few minutes. And most importantly, I want to remind you that... Thank you, Dash. That, this, that Saving Radio City Music Hall is for sale and will be signed by Rosie. So, first of all, I, Rosie, I just want to thank you and indeed Bill, that was really a really tremendous presentation. It was entertaining, it was mo uh, moving, and most importantly, you made a huge difference. And to think that Radio City Hall was going to be decimated if it wasn't for the efforts of you and your colleagues and other in the preservation movement. So on behalf of us all, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, we would like to make a presentation, um, and to do this as Vic Victoria Dengle, our executive director, is going to do so. And Rosemary and Bill, thank you so, so much. And it was, it was so moving to watch this, and, and I, be, be, the fact that you had such a, an impact in terms of saving such an iconic place, Radio City Music music Hall. But for all of us and everyone in the audience, I think, didn't it feel good to be back in the 1970s? It was warm, <laughs> no, well, warm and wonderful and such happy, happy memories of, of a, a very simple and wonderful time. So thank you. And you did a wonderful job of pulling all that together with the footage, really amazing. Thank you, thank you. So, um, on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, founded 1785, and from another landmark facade building and a building that's on the National Register of Historic Places, we express our gratitude to Rosemary Novolino Mearns and to Bill, of <laughs> course, for saving Radio City Music Hall, a dancer's true story for her participation in the General Society Labor, Literature, and Landmark Lecture Series. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Mike. I'm very proud. I'm very proud. Thank you. I did not know this 
was going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. I had not a clue. I am so touched. Yes. And honored. Yes, and because we are not going to let Mr. and Mrs. Marins leave us, we've made you both lifetime members of our oh library. So come back. come back. Come so back. We will. We will. All right. Thank you. Right. Right. Good. Right. 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 <laughs> and, and, and in conclusion, a little memento of the oh, evening and sister. a general society tote bag, perhaps oh. the right way around. So thank you. Thank you. Right. 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 So, everyone, for coming. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you're going to join us now in a glass of wine. And as we've mentioned, this wonderful book is now for sale. So thank you again for coming this evening. Thank you very much.